Gratitude and Greatness is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual. Hi, this is Sarah. Ever since we released this podcast, we've been hearing from people who so appreciate the conversations we're sharing and are wanting something more. I've partnered with one of the loveliest people I know, health coach Erin Vanderkoy, and we will be facilitating a retreat at the Oregon coast called Pause, Breathe, Restore. If you're interested in exploring your grief in a safe, caring, and beautiful environment, please check out pausebreatherestore.com or visit the show notes for this episode. We'd love to have you join us. Gratitude and Greatness explores our relationship with grief, the gratitude for our humanity, and the greatness we attain when we tell our stories. I'm your host, Sarah Shaul. Sometimes the stories we learn about our families are revised to spare survivors of the mental wounds of the past. Seth is working on a memoir to fill in the missing emotional depth of his stoic family's story. I got to talk with Seth about the unexpected triggers of grief and the complexities of generational trauma. So my sister and I are seven years apart in age. I mean, that's a significant age difference. And every now and then I'll recall something from childhood and I have a real difficult time distinguishing sometimes if that was her experience or my experience. Have totally. you had that? Oh, totally. Or something gleaned from, we have a fair bit of eight millimeter film footage. Mm -hmm. So I'm often not sure if I remember something happened or I just watched it and that's become emblematic of that memory or that time or that moment. Is that interesting? I mean, it's all in there theoretically, but how do we access it? Or what happens in between accessing it? That's really what's happening. Do you mean how the stories sort of build up on themselves yes. and the, the story becomes the memory? Yes. Yeah. I'm thinking of people I interact with who have what they would call past life experiences, for instance. As a storyteller, that's such a fascinating way of looking at things. I mean, did it actually happen? Does it matter if it happened? I mean, that's your story of what happened so that it becomes the history. But is history your memory or is history just a story that you tell about what happened? For me, when that happens to me, for someone who really values authenticity, I <laughs> and I'm like, wait, did I just tell a story about myself that's really not a story about myself? You know, you mean that it's untrue? Well, because it didn't happen to me. It happened to my sister, for example. Right. And is it okay to just co-opt that as my own because it feels like my own? Which, you know, kind of leads to the interesting nature of my childhood, which has me so interested in your childhood and a lot of the common things that we share in our histories. You shared a, a piece of writing with me, which is really such beautiful writing and really intense as well. We share a common history of having Eastern European blood, Judaic heritage, and there's so much in this one piece, particularly about continuing moving forward with a really burdensome past and tucking that away. And like you're surrounded by the history, but a history that can't really be spoken. But it, the words are all around you. Well, you, I mean, you're talking about the stories of childhood that we co-opt, we say are ours. What about a situation where those stories are silent? Right. I mean, the silence around the stories is actually more impactful than the stories themselves. I mean, that's a co-option right there. Right. <laughs> this means something, but I don't know what. All these stories about us. I mean, I'm trying to inhabit a child's eye view. Right. You know, looking at these walls. Our very house is built of books. And there's information there, but, but no one's accessing it. Did you read those books? I more looked at the pictures, you know, especially as a very young person, five, six years old. I write about one of those pictures in that essay you're referring to. And the picture's called The Last Jew of Venitsa. And I don't know how old I was when I first saw that picture, but it spoke to something 
in the world being so much wronger and more confusing than I ever thought was possible. And the silence around it, I don't remember talking with my father or my stepmother about what these things meant. It was sort of a private thing. Maybe I sensed that they weren't ready to talk about it. What do you remember specifically about that photo? It's a scene of a mass grave in Venice, which I think is in Ukraine. And it was probably taken around 1941 or so when the Germans had you know, invaded Ukraine in mid-41. In mid there were these groups of German soldiers who were tasked with finding and wiping out Jews. Before they really figured out the gas chambers, they were doing it by hand, so to speak. They were just finding people and shooting them. In the foreground of the picture is this pile of bodies. It takes a minute to figure out what it is because it's blurry black and white. And then in the middle of the photo is a man. I can't tell how old he is. Kind of middle-aged, but wearing more old man clothes of the style. Behind him is this German soldier with a pistol aimed at the back of his head. Mm. This photo was taken by a member of this unit. I think the story was he was later killed and this photo was found on him. And what was written in the back was the last Jew of Manitza. Mm. I think what really struck me is the idea that someone recorded this moment. The man who's about to be shot isn't looking at the camera. He's looking, I guess, to the right of the photographer. But the idea that someone's last moment would be recorded in such a kind of offhand way really struck me. And maybe that's an old person way of looking at things. Maybe I can no longer access how a five-year-old felt looking at that photo. Maybe I'm only, you know, intellectualizing it, I guess. Right. But I don't know. No, that had to have been, at that age, a really incredulous thing to see. Being the mother of two boys, especially when they're younger, everything they picked up, every stick was a gun. Sure. I found that children have this way of suspending the reality of war and guns and all that stuff. They understand this is fantasy. And the fact that you as a five-year-old boy saw that and knew it was reality and not some kind of fantasy. I did. But also, I mean, what does death mean when you're five? You know, th I, I think of all the phrases we use, like back from the dead. Is that literal? I mean, <laughs> when you're five, you don't really know. <laughs> right. And especially if you grow up reading the Bible, which I most certainly did not. Stories like Lazarus or stories like Jesus coming back from the dead. Well, so what does being dead mean? really mean. So in that article that you wrote for Eclectica, you talk about growing up in a Jewish home. No one spoke of the Holocaust, most especially your father. He didn't speak of those atrocities. But you had bookshelves full of books that seemed to whisper, never forget, because that's what we say as Jews. That's what some particular. Jews say. Why do you say some Jews? There's still a debate. Are we going to say never forgive or never forget? Mm. I went to Israel with much of my family, kind of this incredible trip in 2006. And one of the first places we were taken was Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And it's such a fascinating starting point for a trip. I mean, just as a way of framing it, this is where we come from. Who did you go with exactly? Oh boy. I went with my wife, my future wife at that point, my sister and her husband. Her mm -hmm. husband is Israeli. Okay. So we stayed with his father. And then my cousin and aunt came as well. So it was this whole party. And we spent almost a month there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing, amazing trip. It is amazing. And so full of contradictions, too. I mean, talk about being able to metabolize grief or not. Here's a way of starting in the country at this museum, at this memorial to what was done to Jewish people and many other people, too, of course. And then everywhere I went, I felt like I was seeing evidence of how that grief had not been metabolized, on how that endlessly aggrieved posture was playing out against its neighbors. We were in a this beautiful farm and heard shells mm. going over our heads into Gaza. Sometimes traffic was stopped to detonate what might have appeared to be a bomb. It's a very security conscious country. Right. Or watching lines of helicopter and gunships going into Gaza. There was an open conflict at that time. I'm definitely not taking sides. I'm not saying one side is right or they're both right or they're both wrong. I guess what I'm touching on or trying to touch on is the idea that 
you come to Israel and immediately you're exposed to this very stylized and very beautiful monument to grief, talking about Yad Vashem. Yeah. And yet what's happening in everyday life, it's a continuation Pro- of, of... Propagating more yeah. of that or inflicting more of that. Again, exactly. without judgment, but it's a reality. Yeah. How did your family come to decide to go there together? I no longer know. <laughs> we just all wanted to take a trip together. And my sister, I don't know how long they'd been married. I think only a few years at that point. But here was an opportunity to go to Israel and to stay someplace with my brother-in-law's dad. And we jumped on it. This isn't your only sister. She's my only full sister. Okay. My father was married once before my mother. Right. So there's an older half-sister and half-brother. She's significantly older than you. She's 18 years older than me. And her husband was even older than her. He was born not far from Mm Venitsa, ironically enough. He was from Ukraine. And he was born less than two years before the Germans invaded. I think he had a very, very awful experience of the war. They weren't caught, but just so messy. Say if you were Jewish, which Boris, my half-sister's husband was, there were Germans looking for you, but there were also many Ukrainians looking for you too. And there are bands of partisans who were fighting the Germans, but that doesn't mean they were supportive of Jews. They would often kill them or turn them in as well. So just a very messy, <laughs> confusing time. I grew up in the 70s in Washington, D.C. There are very, very clear lines of who was good and bad. We were good. The Soviets were bad. Growing up in D.C., I often felt like, really, there was a bullseye painted on the entire city. There was a hospital about three, four blocks from my house. Nine years before I was born, there was a missile battery behind the hospital during the Cuban Missile Crisis, put there to shoot down Russian bombers. Wow. Nuclear war seemed so close when I was a kid, and we knew that Washington was the target. Well, maybe that's the benefit of growing up in the Midwest. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) I didn't feel much of a target. I feel like my childhood was pretty free of... Anxiety. No, there was a lot of anxiety. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I figured the answer would be, but... And I think that brings up the idea of the epigenetics, that my anxiety, whether it's environmental, the nurture or the nature of it, you know, could it really be in the genes of my family? And I think possibly yes, but maybe it's just growing up around these people that just experience hell. Epigenetics is really interesting. I want to feel like there's a reason for things. You know, I can't really compare my experience with anyone else's. I think I'm probably more prone to anxiety than most people, but who knows? Anxiety seems really, really prevalent right now. There's there's so many great reasons. So there's part of me that wants to say, well, this is what happened. This proves it. I I have this thing. But from what I understand, epigenetics is a really fascinating idea, but no one knows yet how it works, how it changes our genetic expression. There's some case studies. We've talked about Rachel Yehuda and Holocaust survivors people who were in utero during the Dutch famine at the end of World War II. These things happen. They have different expressions, tendency towards schizophrenia, towards obesity, all these things. But we don't know how it works. I mean, in a sense, the effect is the same. (laughs) We feel the anxiety and the heaviness, but we don't know why exactly. Something you and I both share is we both grew up with that too. Mm -hmm. Because you do describe growing up in a household where people didn't talk about these things. Right. But it was evident there was a lot of sadness or unhappiness. You know, I was, I was writing about that time for another piece of work. And my father told me that after my mother's death, his doctor put exactly three sleeping pills in his hand. He closed his hand around them. He said, you will get through this. <laughs> wow. How old were you when your mom passed? I was four and a half. She was bitten by the wrong mosquito. We were on a family vacation in Georgia to a place that's known for having a really high population of mosquitoes. And she contracted encephalitis, Mm -hmm. which is a a sudden onset swelling in the brain. 
a little bit like West Nile virus. Right. Yeah, I think a lot about the idea of cosmic perfection, even when it applies to things that don't sound perfect or good at all. I actually don't know very much about her at all. There's not many people around who remember her. But I know she was sick at some point. She had hepatitis. Encephalitis typically doesn't kill anyone in the United States. It kills a lot of people worldwide, but none here. But she had had hepatitis, and something in her was not able to fight it the way most people could. And on a deeper level, I think, too, about troubled marriage and the idea that a really fierce and independent woman maybe felt like she had made a mistake. She'd settled into something that she didn't actually want. Where did you glean that? There's a box of letters that my mother wrote to my father, probably a couple of years before she died in 1975. And I haven't reread them in a long time. They're pretty awful to read. Mm. But she was a really brainy, really domineering person. She was a lawyer. She got her law degree in the early 60s when that was pretty unusual for women to do. And she was just not going to let old rules stop her from doing what she wanted to do. And she met my father, and I think they were in love. But there was a lot that a woman in her position in the late 1960s had to give up in order to have a family. And of course, that's still true. Mm -hmm. But I think it was harder then. So she gave up her career, and she also found herself married to someone who could not express their emotions in the way that she wanted. And the cosmic perfection imperfection, whatever you want to call it, of their pairing and of her death. And then only a few months after she died, my father going to a Christmas party and walking in and seeing a woman who looked like my mother's double. Wow. And she became my stepmother. Do you see the resemblance between them? A little bit. My father definitely had a type. Yeah. <laughs> he never once said, we are Jewish. But he was married three times in his life, each time, to Jews. Yeah. My sense is that my mother had a really strong sense of herself and her place in the world. And my stepmother did not. Mm. So here's another example of that cosmic perfection. At my stepmother's funeral, her college roommate told my aunt that in college, my stepmother's life plan was to find an older man who had two children from a previous marriage and marry him. That's really interesting. So your father outlived. He outlived two of them. The first wife passed away a few years ago. So your father's, is he still living? No, no, no. No, no. no he died almost 22 years ago. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Cause he's quite a bit older. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He would be 90 this year. So he was married three times then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then your stepmother she more died. recently passed. Yeah, she died in 95. Wow. So you are so young. How old were you when he passed? 26. And your sister is still living? Mm hmm Yeah, my half-sister, she's in her mid-60s. Yeah, she just turned 65. Her husband died in late 2017. And he was 76. I mean, here's the thing about suicide, too. I mean, it was totally shocking, much more for my sister than for me. But how'd she put it? It was surprising, but not shocking. There was a lot he held inside. I mean, he was a very transparent person in some ways, and also not at all. He had a really hard life in a lot of ways. Well, what I read was horrible. I mean, you don't really talk about it, but he, he must have lost his first wife. Divorce. Oh, his divorce. But he had custody of his son. Correct. He was basically estranged from his two kids at the time of his death. But he came over with one child. Mm -hmm. And then the other followed. He, Boris was his name. I think he was also very upfront about the end of his life. He wanted it to be on his terms. I mean, he wasn't sick in any obvious way that we know of, at least. He decided it was his time to go. And I don't condone it in any way. It's like he finally made it through all this crap exactly and he was happy with your sister right they had a pretty rocky last few years but they had reconciled and they just moved into a new house it is it does surprise me when people make that choice to end their lives so much later it's like 
you made it through all this. Well, you know, what I was groping at earlier is that I don't know anything really about the culture that Boris came from, but I don't think his choice is that uncommon. I think that's seen as a courageous way to end your life. I'm done. I don't need special care. I mean, he was someone who began his life living in holes, literally. Right. Hiding. He was a tough SOB. Yeah. And that was his way of taking his life in his own hands. Oh my gosh, so tough. You've taken it upon yourself to write, I don't know if it's safe to say your family history. Yeah, that's as good a description as any, really. It's a memoir slash family history. And what I set out to look at was what part of my story is mine and what part was handed to me by these people and their experiences that came before me. And what has this process been like for you? It's super fun and easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so instructive. And it's really been guided by grief. That was the way in. Mm -hmm. Strangely enough, I had about 20 pages of my dad's writing. I cajoled him into writing down before he died. And there's a lot in there. And there's a lot more that's not in there. It's not really emotional content. So I had these sort of notes about my family history. I had, I had a starting point, but I had nothing to fill it in with. And what led me into it was actually grief in my own life. This sounds so weird to say out loud, but a beloved pet died. And I know this is not uncommon for people as a way in to feeling. But this pet died. <laughs> this pet was a rabbit, not even a dog or a cat. Aww. But a rabbit, a really lovely, lovely beast too. What was your rabbit's name? <laughs> well, we, we had a matching pair, mm -hmm. sister and brother. The sister's still around. Her name is Nutcake. <laughs> and his name was Fruitcake. Aww. They were, they were good, good pets. Very good pets. How long did you have? It was only about three. Okay. Nutcake is still around and she's, what, six? Going on six? So she's doing pretty well. Yeah. But rabbits are really symbolic in my family. My dad really loved rabbits. They were kind of his totem, his spirit animal, although he wouldn't have put it in those terms. All his kids had rabbit nicknames, and he would flip our ears and sort of reach up with an index finger and tweak them gently. He just loved rabbits. He thought they were a really sweet and special animal, even though he never owned them himself, which always disappointed me. I really don't know where it came from, but he just loved rabbits, and it rubbed off on me. Is that why you got pet rabbits? No, I got pet rabbits because I have a daughter, okay. and her preschool had an excess of rabbits. We took two of them. But it quickly turned out that they were really my pets <laughs> more than hers. That's how it always is. Well, but it's funny, not because she ignored them or didn't take care of them, which was also true, but there was something that really called out to me. It's something about their beauty and their total fragility. I mean, rabbits are a very strong species. They exist nearly everywhere. They're not under threat. Their existence is not under threat. Right. But each unit <laughs> is incredibly fragile. At first, I couldn't figure out what I was doing to myself. The fear and anxiety I would feel about them. A predator is going to come. They're going to eat the wrong plant. They'll dig under the fence and get loose. It was really kind of nerve-wracking owning them. Do you have the same concerns as a parent? Mm -hmm. of keeping your daughter Similar. safe and caring for her? And Oh, sure. I mean, that's that's a reliable source of anxiety. Sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a go-to. <laughs> but it was something about the rabbits that really grabbed me. I mean, I felt deeply responsible for them and to them. And so one of them died. He I don't know what happened. Rabbits get sick. They die. They're very fragile, like I said. And it opened up this kind of trap door. And I recognized some elements of it. I took care of my dad at the end of his life. I spent, I think, about seven months with him. Mm. And we got to go to Hungary and say goodbye to his family there and his friends. That's really wonderful. They, he was well enough to travel with yeah. you. Yeah. He made it a priority. 
he wanted to have some quality of life and to have that chance. And so when the rabbit died, I felt some of those feelings again. If you allow it, it's entering into a kind of dream state. Grief. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. What was strange is that I found, I won't say that I liked it because it's so uncomfortable, but it was showing me so much. It was showing me that there was so much behind what I see in this plane. It spurred me to start writing about it and to keep digging and to keep going. Well, what are some of the things that it revealed for you? When I was a teenager, I did a lot of drugs. I really gravitated towards psychedelics, LSD, mushrooms. And I insisted at the time that it was completely recreational. There's no therapeutic value whatsoever. And this is in the 80s when people weren't really talking about the therapeutic benefit of those medicines they had in the 50s and 60s, early 60s. And they do now, but they definitely didn't then. Mm -hmm. And so it was easy to say, oh, this is just an escape. Yeah. Because my life as a teenager felt very unpleasant and kind of claustrophobic. Try as I might, I actually feel like I learned a lot from those experiences. I was shown a lot. For me, diving into grief and allowing it to sort of run through my veins had the same effect. Some psychedelics give you the sensation that there are more dimensions to what we perceive. Yeah. But allowing grief to happen rather than shoving it away was showing me that there was a much greater experience of this life that I was not living. I felt like I was trying to just get through it. And I couldn't recognize that until grief showed me what I was missing. The idea of grief being a destination for some people, I do seek it out in the form of my own memories and my family stories. But I don't consider it a destination. I, I consider it leverage, a place to get into that fuller experience of this life. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be metabolized. I think it has to be walked through. And I think grief showed me that you can't think your feelings. You have to just feel them. And when grief really crushes you and you allow it to happen, there's no thinking anymore. For a lot of people, I think especially men, that's a hard place to be. But it's a really, really rich place to be to get to what's next. Do you think that, or do you feel that, that experiencing or allowing yourself to go into that space of grief was the first time that you truly were able to tap certain emotional elements within yourself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my mother died when I was four and a half. And my memories of that day are weirdly precise. I understood immediately that it was my job to demonstrate sadness in a certain way, in a very controlled way, and then to pack it up and move on. And to pack it up and move on because that's what the rest of your family needed you to do? That's what survivors do. Mm. They survive. And that's how you survive. That's what your family has shown you. That's what's been exhibited for you. Yes. Yeah. So you, being a parent now, mm -hmm. and with the loss of this pet, were you able to exhibit something different for your own daughter and set a different kind of example? I definitely was. And my daughter is also the perfect teacher for me because she does not exhibit those feelings. She does not want to go there. And so the question for me was, how as a parent do I show how important it is to acknowledge what's happened and yet not expect her to have a reaction that she's not ready or willing to have? My daughter thinks her parents are kind of pseudo-spiritual weirdos. <laughs> How old is she? She's 11. Yeah. Yeah. But it's surprising. You'd think she's older. And she's not an unemotional person, but the way she expresses it and the way that she feels like examining it is very different. It's perfect for me as a parent because it's the opposite of what I'm pursuing. I want greater emotional openness and expression. And she resists that. You also are a musician, and you are a writer, and you're deep into this memoir you're working on. You're also working on your house. You're a busy guy. I am very busy. I'm just wondering, 
which of these mediums best address your pursuit of that emotional openness? In a perfect world, all of them. Uh huh. <laughs> but the writing is definitely the most explicit. I think for me, the challenge is using grief as a way in and a way through, not as a destination in and of itself. Yeah. Because it's pretty easy to write something that will grab people around the ears and say, this awful thing happened. Can you imagine it? That's not really what I'm after. I think it's a way to, to look deeper behind those stories and behind those flashy, frightening emotions that it generates. So what exactly are you after? I want an emotional history. I want to know what happened. And I want authenticity, quoting you. I want to present as true of a story as I possibly can. This is really what happened in this plane of existence. But I want to examine what that felt like, the people living it. I mean, especially when you're writing about the just epical and wrenching things that happened in, I would say, both of our families in the early part of the 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century. It's so easy to get focused on the big story. These 100,000 people were rounded up and taken to a camp. These 100,000 people were evicted from their homes and sent to live in the steppes. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, all these things were happening. I want the emotional history. What did that feel like? I don't want to crush people or bludgeon them with this stuff. But how did it actually feel? I love history. And what grabs me about it is that every time I read it, there are these chains of continuity. I mean, that's why we can read something written 500 or 1,000 years ago and recognize people's motivations and their stories and their fears and their hopes. It may be expressed in very different ways, and that's so fascinating too, reading about a culture that didn't fear death in the same way that we did. But we're still human beings, and those stories still resonate over time, and that's what I want to catch. What did it feel like to be a human? Where I need the huge story as a context for the human story. We had talked earlier about how it's really impossible to know how somebody's really feeling. It's really what people choose to present. And so I'm so curious at how you're able to identify their emotions. What do you have to work with? How are you able to... Exactly. <laughs> there's, there's, there's very little. I mean, in, in the literal sense, I don't have a diary. Right. You know what I mean? And even when I do, like something my father wrote, there's no emotional content. Mm -hmm. I have to put together my picture of him as a person, and I have to go into that realm of feeling, the one that I feel grief mm -hmm. sort of cracked open for me. Right. And so what did that feel like? Knowing, let's say, take my father as an example, knowing the person I did and seeing the many facets of him, someone who was very gentle, and kind, and at ease with himself, but also recognizing the fractures, the parts that were off limits, the parts that could not stand next to grief and tracing them back through time. So where did that come from? What is the experience of being hunted due to a young person? What is the experience of shame about your body? I mean, I'm thinking of Jewish men. I know that as a child in grade school in Hungary, he was singled out very early as a Jew. Oh, just from being circumcised. Exactly. And his classmates on the playground would sometimes pull down his pants to check. Mm. Are you still Jewish? So I'm using kind of the rawest, gnarliest examples. And again, that's not where I want to stay. But I'm using these sort of emotional guideposts. And knowing that I'm presenting the story, the technical story, as best I can. This is what happened in this month of this year. But I'm filling in the details by looking inside, too. That's the only guideposts I have, really. My memories of my dad and my grandparents as humans. You're like an interpreter of sorts, really. I just hope I'm an accurate one. Yeah, that's tough. One wrinkle of the story, which really informs it for me, but it's confusing to write about, is the fact that I don't believe some of my father's stories. Oh, yeah. I know that certain stories that some of my family have shared have been manufactured. Mm -hmm. I have figured some of that out. Some of that has been to protect themselves, or maybe they felt they were protecting me. Mm -hmm. In my dad's case, it was a kind of projection, a way he wanted the story to have been. 
Mm. Because very early, he recognized that he was not going to have the same experience as the people around him because of the arbitrariness of his Jewishness. Yeah. And no one wants to feel powerless. I think everything my dad did after the war and after he came to America was to try to build up the sense of power and safety. Yeah. So it's so vulnerable to go back in time and admit how weak you were, how weak you felt, and how scared you felt. So do you think it's more authentic to present what your dad wanted to present, or more authentic to present what you think was really... I'm trying to do both. Yeah. That's the challenge as a writer, because I'm taking these moments that I think are not quite true, Mm -hmm. and trying to frame them kind of as this movie that's playing. There's a bunch of eight millimeter footage starting in the 50s, my dad's first American family, and then running through the mid 70s, his second American family being me and my sister and mother. Those movies become a kind of shorthand. They become the memories sometimes. Mm-hmm. I'm presenting my dad's stories, his more fantastical ones, as his version of those movies. They've become the memory And they're a flawed one because the details change over time. And that's how you can tell, wait a second, you said it was this. No, I thought it was that. But that's the projection of who we want it to have been. You know, you have this beautiful family, so much opportunity. So with all this heavy material that you're digging into right now, how you are able to hold both at once? Because the heaviness, I don't know if I even see as heaviness anymore. But the depths, the grief exposed, let me see, they're the way to every other feeling. Grief is not a destination for me, but it's a way in and a way through. And before I allowed that to happen, I had a very different experience of this life. And it was mostly not a very happy one. So that's what this has done for me. So you have more joy in your life now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, the heaviness doesn't negate it. It enables it to happen. I love that. And I feel the same. And the more I dig into grief, it's more about me acknowledging something that's there every day. Maybe I'm not feeling it every single day, but I'm acknowledging other people's grief. I'm acknowledging that it's everywhere, every minute, every day. And I have questioned, like, how can I be so happy? Because it seems to be counterintuitive. Well, they're the same thing. I mean, getting intimate with death, whether my parents' deaths or even my pets' deaths, is getting intimate with life. You can't separate the two. And so you're positing that if you're intimate with life, you're able to more fully experience all that it has to offer Including, including joy and and including loss, mm-hmm. including even anxiety too. I mean, I don't I don't think any feelings are less valuable than others. Some are less pleasant to feel, but we made them all. They're all us. Grief, gratitude, and greatness is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual in Portland, Oregon. This episode was produced and edited by Jack Saturn and me, Sarah Shaul. The music was by Samantha Jensen. Visit us online at griefgratitudegreatness.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at griefgratitudegreat. Subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you like to listen. And leave us a review. Your feedback helps our show and helps us find new listeners. If you have a story of your own that you'd like to share or topics you'd like to hear more about, we'd love to hear from you. Call or text our show at 503-454-6646 or send us a message via the contact link at griefgratitudegreatness.com. Be sure to let your friends know about us and join us next time. We look forward to sharing more conversations with you.